CataractCoach.com. Cataract Coach Curriculum, Lesson 6, Viscoelastics, also called OVDs, Ophthalmic Viscosurgical Devices. Now, there's a whole spectrum of viscoelastics. And you can see on the left, the yellow, more liquid. And on the right, the green is more solid. So on the left, the more liquid ones are dispersive viscoelastics. And on the right, they're cohesive. Now, the ultimate and the thinnest dispersive would be HPMC, hydroxypropyl methylcellulose. And again, the dispersive ones tend to coat things. The cohesive tend to stick together. And they're more solid than they are liquid. In fact, they behave more of a solid and behave as a cohesive mass. If you look at this, we can inject a little bit on top of a penny here, and you can see the dispersive flattens out because it coats. And so it'll flatten out on that penny, and you can't make a big lump of it. Whereas on the right, the green one, the cohesive one, the cohesive one is thick. And as a result, you can make a big blob there on top of that penny. Now, when we put it in the eye initially, we want to exchange it. The OVD goes in the eye, and the aqueous comes out. So cannula is brought across the midline of the AC, then the wave of viscoelastic is injected. So the AC is filled up with viscoelastic while pushing the aqueous out that same paracentesis incision. So again, it's an exchange. Viscoelastic in, aqueous comes out. There is a soft shell technique. We'll talk more about that. This is the surgeon view from above. You can see the soft shell technique described by Arshinov is to have both a cohesive and a dispersive in the same eye. CataractCoach.com Dispersive versus cohesive viscoelastic. When to use each type of OVD, ophthalmic viscosurgical devices. Now, viscoelastics, also referred to as OVDs, ophthalmic viscosurgical devices, they're viscous substances that allow us to make phaco easier and safer. Now, there are many viscoelastics on the market. Remember, there are two main classes, dispersive and cohesive. Now, what are the differences when you use each? Which is better for each step of the surgery? Let's talk about it. So the two main classes, dispersive and cohesive, they do behave differently. Remember, there are combination OVDs and viscoadaptive OVDs, but their use is not as common for routine cataract cases. Dispersive OVDs have the consistency of honey or syrup or molasses, and they're able to flow like thick liquids. This gives dispersive OVDs the ability to coat ocular structures well. And this coating is not easily washed away by the inflow of balanced salt solution during surgery. This coating of dispersive OVD is helpful to protect the corneal endothelium from the ultrasonic waves and also BSS during surgery. Since it's more liquid than solid, it's also a good choice for lubricating the lens injector cartridge. The downside to dispersive OVD is that it's not as good as maintaining space within the eye. And it can be more difficult to remove at the end of case. Examples of dispersive OVDs include Viscoat from Alcon, Endocoat from Johnson & Johnson, and Ocucoat from Bausch & Lomb. Note that they all have the word coat in the name, since these dispersive viscoelastics coat the eye like honey. A very commonly used viscoelastic around the world that's very dispersive is HPMC, hydroxypropyl methylcellulose, which is actually derived from plant. Cellulose is in the name, right? It's the most dispersive OVD, and it's probably not the best at protecting the delicate corneal endothelium, and it can actually wash off pretty easily. So if you're using HPMC, you may have to recoat the eye or the tissues many times. Most of the other viscoelastics are actually made from rooster combs. Yeah, you heard that right, rooster combs. And if you're interested, Google more, you'll find out. Now, cohesive OVDs, they're more solid than liquid. And they have the consistency of a gelatin, which means they can't really coat or flow as well. But because they're much thicker, they're able to maintain space and pressurize the eye quite well. This is useful to keep the anterior chamber formed, let's say when you're, while you're inserting an IOL, to keep the capsule flat during rexus creation, to move or manipulate iris or other tissues. And again, even keeping vitreous back, it can be helpful, but they can also be removed very easily. At the end of a routine case, it's nice because you can remove it from the eye very easily because the whole bolus of OVD is cohesive and it washes out. Once part of it's pulled from the eye with the suction tip, the rest tends to follow. Again, examples of this include ProVisc from Alcon, Helon or Helon GV from Johnson & Johnson, and AmVisc from Bausch & Lomb. Remember, there's a whole spectrum of viscoelastics beyond just the two big categories of 
simply cohesive and simply dispersive. Combination OVDs tend to be in the middle of the spectrum, and they may have some dispersive properties as well as some cohesive properties. For many surgeons, using a moderate OVD has the best of both, and they're able to use that one single viscoelastic for the entire surgery. Examples of this include DiscoVisc from Alcon or Amvisc Plus from Bausch & Lomb. Viscoadaptive OVDs act differently under various fluidic parameters on the FACO platform. At low flow, they stay together and they act as a cohesive viscoelastic, while at high flow rates, they tend to fracture and come out in pieces much like a dispersive. An example of a viscoadaptive OVD is Helon 5 from Johnson & Johnson. With this agent, be very certain to fully remove it from the eye since it can cause high pressure spikes, which may necessitate a return trip to the OR for aspiration. There are dual OVD packages, so other surgeons may prefer having two viscoelastic syringes, one cohesive, one dispersive for every surgery. Examples of this include DuoVisc from Alcon, which is Viscoat and ProVisc, and then the Helon Duet, which is Endocoat and Helon, and that's from J&J. Since having two OVDs packed together in one, one box is actually a patent, which is owned by Alcon, and it's been licensed to J&J, we may not see other examples of this in the near future. The ideal viscoelastic characteristics for each step of the surgery kind of depend on the surgeon's preferences. And you may find out, like me, I'll use a dispersive throughout most of the surgery and then just cohesive at the very end to fill the caps or bag for the IOL. Remember, at the end of surgery, it's important to thoroughly remove viscoelastic from the eye, otherwise it can block the trabecular meshwork and you can experience a high IOP in your patient. The dispersives can be a little hard to remove because they have a tendency to spread out and coat structures. Cohesives tend to stick together as a single mass and are usually easier to fully remove. Use of the viscoelastic can make FACO easier for the surgeon and safer for the patient. It's for this reason they've become an integral part of our surgeries. Cataractcoach.com, we have a routine cataract surgery here and I want to show you the soft shell technique that was popularized by Steve Arshinoff. So starting out a routine case, putting anesthetic, so it's this preserve-free lidocaine, in the eye and on the cornea. Now for the soft shell technique, first we're going to instill a dispersive viscoelastic. So we'll put the dispersive viscoelastic in, and we want to aim it towards the endothelium. Obviously don't touch the endothelium. Now we'll get our cohesive viscoelastic and inject it under that. And there's the cohesive going in. That has two benefits. One, it deepens the AC and maintains the space. And two, it pushes the dispersive up against the corneal endothelium to protect it even more. Main incision being made here with a diamond keratome. Now watch that central bolus of the cohesive viscoelastic. And as we maneuver in the eye and slightly open the incision, we'll lose some of that. And that's to be expected. So we're going to tear around capsular rexus here. The soft shell technique can be used in cases where you want the benefit of both a cohesive and a dispersive. So by using the two agents here, we can achieve multiple qualities at once. So endothelial protection as well as good space maintenance by the cohesive. Now, when we do our hydro dissection, we're certainly going to lose viscoelastic. There, it keeps burping out the incision. Cohesive will burp out a lot easier than dispersive. So the viscoelastic that came out is probably mostly the cohesive one. There's the nucleus that's rotating fine. So let's refill and recoat the endothelium centrally with that dispersive, just to be sure. We want to protect that cornea during phaco emulsification. So we're getting our phaco probe here. Make sure the tip's the way we like it and the chopper goes in the eye. For this nucleus, we're just gonna do one chop right down the middle, there we go. That'll give us two halves, and this nucleus isn't so dense, so we can remove one half without any further subdividing or chopping. So the chopper here is just being used to keep the cataract pieces in front of the phaco tip. We don't want it beneath the phaco tip. And then the second half of the nucleus comes up. We'll do one little chop, there we go and then the remaining pieces can be aspirated. So with this much of a uh, dis viscoelastic protection, as well as a short surgery, we can be sure they're gonna have a clear cornea tomorrow. There's the last little piece of the nucleus coming out, and we're ready for our IA. Total amount of phaco energy in this case is quite low, and again, we had good viscoelastic protection. 
IA probe now is going to be a higher flow setting. Remember with a high flow setting, you're going to remove that cohesive viscoelastic if any remains quite quickly. So taking out the lens cortex, 360 degrees. Again, I like the circumferential manner uh, to get to grab at least a couple clock hours prior to stripping it towards the center. And again, this is a very critical step to take your time. We don't want to damage that delicate posterior capsule, which can be as thin as four microns centrally. So just think about that. That's half of a red cell. A red cell is generally thought to be about seven and a half microns in diameter. Cohesive viscoelastic now being in, instilled in the eye to inflate the capsular bag. And now we'll get our lens. It's a single piece acrylic lens in this case. I'm going to deliver it right in the capsular bag. The cohesive here will come out quite easily, so it maintains space very well, so the bag is nicely deepened, so it's easy to implant the lens. The anterior and posterior capsule are separated from each other. The bag is deep, as well as the AC being deep. Lens is in good position here now. We'll take the eye probe, go underneath the eye well, remove that viscoelastic, and then remove the viscoelastic from in front of the eye well. Now behind the eye wall is all cohesive, so it comes out very quickly, very easily. In front of the eye wall, we have the cohesive plus the viscoelastic that was remaining on the corneal endothelium. We're using a high flow setting here to really get fluid to wash off that dispersive. Here, just cleaning up the underside of that capsular bag and moving in all areas of the anterior chamber to get the viscoelastic out. So interesting case of using two different viscoelastics to do the soft shell technique. Not something I normally do, but certainly something that we can learn from. Thanks for watching. CataractCoach.com, the viscoelastic wave. We want to avoid the spaghetti. We actually want a nice clean wave. What do I mean by that? Well, we have a routine cataract case here. We're putting anesthetic inside the eye. When we put the dispersive viscoelastic in the eye, the goal is to coat the corneal endothelium but also to completely fill the anterior chamber. So we want to do an exchange. So viscoelastic going in the eye, and then we want the aqueous coming out. So we come across, and if I push slowly on the plunger, see you get all that spaghetti? That doesn't work. That comes right out of the eye. So you push the plunger a little bit harder, more force, and then you'll get a nice wave of dispersive viscoelastic. So coming across the eye here, watch how the blue dye is displaced, just like that. A nice clean wave, and that's the reason we come across the anterior chamber to the opposite angle of the eye. So let's watch this a few more times. So our dispersive cannula goes across the eye, we inject, and there's the wave. And you can see how it pushes the bubbles out to the periphery, to the angle of the eye. And that's a nice, good, solid fill, good pressure. So again, come across the eye, there's spaghetti string that doesn't work, so we have to do a wave, a little bit more force on the plunger. Once we have that viscoelastic wave, we're sure that it's gonna completely coat the corneal endothelium and it'll stay in position even when we use high flow during cataract surgery. Finally, here was one more case. We'll come across the eye again and we're gonna slowly uh, make sure we don't deflate the anterior chamber and then with a forceful push, we get a wave of viscoelastic. So make sure when you use this dispersive, get a wave. CataractCoach.com. Do you need to go behind the eye well to remove the viscoelastic? Seems like a difficult maneuver. So we're used to this scenario. Capsular bag is empty. We'll fill it up with a cohesive viscoelastic. And now we'll inject our eye well into the capsular bag. And we've all done this maneuver, of course, many, many times during routine cataract surgery. But when we put this eye well in the capsular bag, this optic is gonna trap some viscoelastic behind it. Now we've got about a five or five and a half millimeter diameter capsorexis. That's a six millimeter optic. So do we need to actually go around the capsorexis and under the IOL optic to get a viscoelastic like this? Notice how the eye well is lifted towards the seating of the room or towards the apex of the cornea. And once we remove the viscoelastic from behind the eye well, then we can clean up the anterior segment and remove the viscoelastic from the AC as well as the angle of the eye. And that looks great. So the question is, do you have to do it? And it depends on the case. 
If you're a new surgeon who's starting off, you've done less than 100 cataracts, it's perfectly acceptable to not do that, to just tilt or rock the optic back and forth and try to express as much viscoelastic as you can that way. But as you get better and better and more confident with your intraocular skills, it does become important to remove that viscoelastic. Look at this case. You see the toric IOL marks, the, the haptic optic junction. So this is certainly a toric lens. And now look, they're also diffractive rings. This is a trifocal toric IOL. Now this IOL has to be placed at a very specific axis, and we have to center these diffractive rings exactly correct. Now this IOL optic is slightly tacky, and it'll tend to stay where we put it. It'll stick to the capsule bag. But it'll only stick to the capsule bag if there's no viscoelastic there. Viscoelastic behind the optic will allow it to slide and move around, and we can have this torque lens shift to the wrong axis, or we can have the IOL optic rings shift out of the center of the visual axis. So in that case, certainly it's very important. Let's look at another one. Time to go under the IOL and remove viscoelastic, and again, you see there are diffractive rings. So the main reason we're avoiding um, leaving viscoelastic in the eye is that it's going to allow that IOL to shift. So if we really are careful to remove all the viscoelastic from the back surface of the IOL, from the posterior capsular surface, that'll allow the IOL object to stick into position. There's also an, another issue, which is intraocular pressure. Retained viscoelastic in the eye can lead to high intraocular pressure after surgery. So we've all seen those post-op patients. They had a beautiful cataract surgery. And in the post-op period, immediately post-op day one or day three or even week one, the pressure is high. Usually after day one, two, three, the pressure is high in the eye because of retained viscoelastic. It's not from a steroid response. Remember, the IOP spike from a steroid response ends up coming at around the two-week mark after surgery or after beginning the use of topical steroids. So here, you look at the video, another trifocal and toric IOL that has to be placed at a very specific axis in terms of rotation, plus we have to center the diffractive rings with those Purkinje images. So in this case, it's absolutely critical that you remove the viscoelastic from behind the optic. So if you're going to do a toric lens, a diffractive lens, a multifocal lens, a toric multifocal lens, all those, it's very important to remove viscoelastic. If you're doing a monofocal lens, it's not quite as critical. You may have issues with IOP spikes right after surgery. And this maneuver does take some practice. You're shifting the eye well within the capsule bag. And remember, you're lifting the eye well up towards the corneal apex. Let's show you one more video of going behind the eye well. So here's the eye well going in the capsule bag as it unfolds quite nicely. We'll rotate it around. It helps to keep the haptics like this 90 degrees away from your incision. That allows you to place your phaco probe in the subincisional area, get under the IOL optic, lift it towards the corneal apex, and then remove viscoelastic. Use a high flow and high vacuum setting on your IA machine. So again, important to lift the IOL optic up towards the corneal apex. That's the correct maneuver. Don't just shove the IOL towards the caps or bag equator. You wanna have a proper technique here. So my opinion is, if you're just starting off first 100 cases, don't worry too much about it. You're probably just doing monofocal IOLs anyway, but certainly you do need to progress to the point where you are going behind the IOL to fully remove viscoelastic. It'll give your patients the best results.